um, lived most of her childhood in the U.S., uh, moved to Argentina as a teenager. She has a master's uh, degree in applied linguistics and TESOL and has been involved in the education field for many years. Karina's career began nearly 30 years ago when she taught business English classes at international companies. And during that, that time, she also taught general English to young learners. She has also shared her knowledge in the field of English teaching as a speaker at TEFL or TESOL conferences and developed content for some of our teach training courses. Karina joined Bridge in 2003 at the Center in Buenos Aires, Argentina, as the head IDELT trainer. I hope I got that right. And is currently yeah, a Bridge tutor and the academic trainer at the Bridge English Center in Santiago. Chile. A very uh, impressive background. Karina, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Martina. Um, okay, thank you uh, so much for letting me be here. And uh, I hope everybody likes this presentation. I feel that 21st century skills are uh, something we talk a lot about. And professional development is also something that um, sometimes we take for granted. So I wanted to connect those two and also present some classroom activities that will enhance these 21st century skills. So um, let me start by sharing the screen because I have this presentation that I want to share with everybody. So, okay. So a little bit about uh, myself before we begin. Uh, Martina made a wonderful introduction. Um, and yes, I've been working for Bridge for many years and I am in at this time since you got the bio and now my position changed again, of course, as we were talking. Um, so right now I'm the teacher experience manager. I'm in charge of teachers and making sure that their um, jobs are something they enjoy. So professional development is something that we we develop a lot of time and effort into having everybody um, try to become the best version of them, themselves. So uh, I hope this helps everybody else. Um, so, and then a little bit, that was me, a little bit about Bridge. Um, we have been in the industry for over 35 years now. Um, we have accreditation from the asset, the Aquadotto, and um, we have several TEFL courses. Our center in Denver is specialized in training. And then we have a center in Chile specialized in business English. So this is a combination of both of our uh, areas that I'm going to bring here to everybody. OK. So we're going to talk about the power of professional development, how this helps teachers invest in their future. When we talk about professional development, we're thinking about anything we can do as teachers to develop our skills, our expertise, and our effectiveness. So this should be an ongoing process, and being able to make this effort results in best practices. So some examples of CPD, continuous professional development. Examples of CPD include formal courses, certifications. This is what we know is most popular, right? But that shouldn't be the limit. Attending a workshop is part of professional development, a seminar, a conference. We're developing our skills because we have the opportunity to learn from our colleagues, exchange ideas, talk to other people that are doing something very similar. And we can also, another form of professional development, right, is research online, find material, find professional literature, research papers, there's tons. And that also will give you the ability to, once you start reading some professional papers, to select which ones are um, the best ones, the ones that could really help you, right? Um, maybe one of the most important aspects of CPD is also being able to reflect upon our own professional practice, keeping a journal, writing things down, taking notes, um, or even something as simple as finding a more experienced colleague a coach, a mentor, anybody who can guide us through better performance, that's also considered professional development. And this also has an extra benefit. If you're not a native English speaker, if you engage in activities that involve other professionals or literature in English, we're also exposed to language. And that helps us with our own language proficiency. We can improve our own English. 
There are many words, expressions, phrases that we can learn. It's important to consider this aspect as well when thinking about professional development, right? And on top of that, if a school is concerned about CPD, that's a school that cares for their teachers. And that ultimately has a positive impact on students as well, because happy teachers usually get happier students. So another important part of um, professional development is technology. There are websites, digital libraries, research papers, interactive platforms. Sometimes you can find lesson plans, teaching strategies, materials, it makes our job so much easier. We can also learn, use learning apps, grammar checks, educational software. Technology is the reason why we're meeting here, right, after all, or at any other virtual workshop, course, program. The internet allows teachers to learn without borders. Right now, I'm in Buenos Aires. There's people from Vietnam I saw over there. Um, so yeah, this helps us connect a lot better. We can collaborate, we can network, discuss, share ideas. Technology can foster a sense of community. It also provides like an avenue for ongoing learning and support. But technology can also be applied in the classroom. We can use blended approaches, educational technology. It can also help with assessment, online quizzes, evaluation, tracking of student progress, multimedia presentations, audio recordings, so much more. So incorporating technology in the classroom enhances student engagement. It promotes digital literacy. It prepares learners for the digital demands of the 21st century. So speaking of which, So nowadays, we experience changes in a flash. By the time someone finishes school, their knowledge is already outdated. Jobs change, job requirements change. We need to keep up with those changes. We can't anticipate what might happen. The only thing we know is what will not happen, the world as we know it, basically. So when we're thinking about the future, in such a rapidly changing world, how can we project ourselves into this future? Can we even imagine what it might be like? So to go back a little bit, our current educational system has been designed following the requirements set during the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment era. And these were very similar to factory production line, workstation one, workstation two, workstation three, like grade one, grade two, grade three, and you progress through school in a series of stages, like a factory. Countries invest in education because they hope that this will lead to long-term economic well-being. So the skills and the competencies that schools develop are driven by the economy of the time. Uh, we were saying the world has changed. The imperatives in the world of work have changed and the economy of the world has changed. And this has a huge impact on education. So we can no longer follow this utilitarian view of scholarization. We need critical thinking. We need lateral thinking, creativity, problem solving. These started to become valuable skills that need to be developed. So before computers appeared, workers were doing simple manual tasks. But these tasks were repetitive. So we started to try to find a more effective way of doing these same things. Came the computer. Computers started taking over these routines and repetitive tasks. So many of the jobs that we were doing started disappearing. However, those tasks that require problem solving, complex communication, and social skills, they can't be performed by computers. Collaboration, adaptability, they started to become valuable skills because those people who have these skills are more difficult to replace. And even more so, if these people have the ability to adapt and acquire new skills on their own, they will be even more difficult to replace by a computer. Now that we have artificial intelligence, we can have a computer learning from their own experience. So there are other skills that we need to develop to make sure that our jobs are still valuable to the community. So jobs won't entirely disappear they'll be redefined. So people will start needing new skill sets for these new roles because these roles will no longer be, be 
necessary. So jobs that involve genuine creativity, such as being an artist, being a scientist, developing a new business strategy, those jobs can't be replaced by a computer. Neither can occupations that involve building complex relationships with people or those that deal with highly unpredictable events like teaching English. Let's face it, there's tons of apps out there, but no one can replace us, at least not yet. So this is why professional development and 21st century skills are so connected, because having this ability to learn new things, to learn new skills, will also help us be able to cope with the, this rapidly changing world. Okay, so 21st century skills is connected to knowledge, life skills, career skills, habits, and traits. These are critically important to students' success in today's world, because we can also help students develop these 21st century skills as well. And as they move on to college, the workforce, adult life, they will need these skills as well. And nowadays, they're not teaching these in school. So as we mentioned, mere repetition of facts, that's not useful. Computers can do that. Google can do that. Chat GPT, that's awesome. How many times have we used it to plan a lesson? So today, we're going to go over three of these 21st century skills and describe some of them and mention some ideas to use in classroom to help our students develop those skills. First one I want to talk about is collaboration. I love that image to speak of collaboration because individualism leads to heroes. One person single-handedly defeating the dangers of the universe, coming to a rescue and making us believe that we actually need to be rescued, right? But we're hardwired to believe this is possible. We overglorify leaders who exude charisma, bold personality, arrogant. If you ask me, maybe a little bit narcissistic, right? But it's my opinion. So again, before talking about century 21, I would like to go back to the beginning of century 20. I'd like to go back to Vygotsky, a Russian constructivist psychology uh, psychologist from the early 1900s. I think many of you must know him. His theory is still applied today. Um, he stated that children have three basic areas, what they have learned, what they can learn yet, potentially, and what they can't learn yet. So he called this area of the potential to learn something, this area of what they can learn soon enough, the zone of proximal development, he called it ZPD. And he observed that learning occurs best when there's someone else helping, especially if it's a more competent peer. So this led to the importance of collaborative learning that we're talking about these days as if it were 21st century skills and something really new. It's not. So back to ZPD, if something's too difficult or too frustrating, obtaining help can increase their skills. Um, Jerome Brunner in the 1960s used the term scaffolding to connect it to Vygotsky's uh, ZPD. This will help, this support is the support that students receive while learning something new, just like with buildings. As teachers, we provide help in a certain moment, a scaffold, and then once they're ready, we remove it and the building stays there. Overhelping students would risk turning them into passive learners hindering their growth instead of facilitating it. Not helping at all would increase frustration and a sense of underachievement. So, I like Scott Thornbury's uh, views of this term as well, when he talks about a language system like being under construction, because that will let them attempt language tasks they might still not be ready for, and sometimes may even succeed. So, Holding their hands through the learning process, giving them crutches, it's not such a bad practice. Then another definition. Ibrahim talks about dependability and a sense of companionship, not being alone, togetherness. When students are working in groups, they'll be part of a community where everyone will lend support to one another. Students need the support while learning, and when students of different performance levels cooperate with each other towards achieving one desired goal, 
they're not merely accountable for their own learning process, but they're also responsible for their peers' learning process as well. In other words, succeed, success will breed more success. So the learning experience can be enriched even more when the teaching method which is used takes into account the interests and motivation of the learners. Students will feel more motivated with collaborative learning. This is because the students will feel in charge and empowered in terms of their own learning process. Um, I wanna share something that happened with my son. During the pandemic, he became friends with a group of kids that were learning online. One of them usually participated in math Olympiads and would win the gold medals. He's like a genius, but my son wasn't. So this friend started regular Zoom meetings with his closest friends, my son among them, to help him out with math problems nobody was understanding. My son finished high school with straight A's in math and so did his friends. So collaborative learning is when a group of two or more students work together to achieve a shared goal. Students interact and they share knowledge to complete a task, learning together along the way. So pair work, group work, learners practice communicating in English at the same time, leaving you just there to sit back, watch, relax, and monitor, take notes, and then give feedback. Collaboration involves being part of a group, and that requires listening skills. So here are some ideas for exercises. Information gap is, you know, one person has part of the information, not all. The other person has the other part but not this one. So they need to interact. Jigsaw readings. Have one group of students read one paragraph. They don't see the full text, just one paragraph. Another group has another paragraph. Have them create their own summary. Bring the class together without looking at their summaries so that it's not that they copy. Without looking at their summaries, have them compile the full text together and then compare with the original. Group story building. Create a story all together. Spot the difference. Have two texts. Where's the difference? Compare. But they don't, they don't see each other's text, for instance. So they have to start asking, what does it say here? What about this guy? How old is this person in your text? Oh, in mine, it's different. Communicative crosswords. One person has the definition. The other has to ask the question. But collaborative learning is not just working in groups. It also involves negotiating meaning. So a little bit of these activities all develop students' communicative competence through negotiation of meanings while they're sharing information. Um, next skill that we're going to talk about, leadership. Yeah, leadership, the ability to lead, yes, to influence, to guide people. Former U.S. President uh, Eisenhower said that leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done, making them believe they want to do it. It involves making decisions, having a clear vision, establishing achievable goals, and providing the tools to reach those goals. Sorry, was I mute? No, no. We can oh, okay. Hi, Garita. Okay, because I had like, yeah, I had a sign saying that I should reactivate my audio. So characteristics a leader uh, possesses, self-confidence, strong communication and management skills, creative, innovative thinking, perseverance in the face of failure, willingness to take risks, openness to change, level-headedness, reactiveness in times of crisis. Some people have all these characteristics inherently, but the truth is leadership skills can also be developed. So how can we develop leadership skills in class? No, not there yet, sorry. No slide for that. Okay, some ideas for um, activities for class. For teenagers or children, the tallest tower, not for online classes though. Students use everyday items such as toothpicks, wooden blocks, uncooked pasta, whatever. The task is to build the tallest possible freestanding structure with the materials given. 
So this is in, to encourage problem solving, creative problem solving, and collaboration because they have a bunch of things they have to decide which goes first to make sure that that tower stands. Another activity could be used for business classes, center stage. Get four team members as volunteers. One team member plays the role of an employee who has missed meetings or has been late to work a lot. And the other three participants demonstrate how their boss would react. So each of them have to use different leading styles, different, not mocking their boss, but using different ways to be the boss. Uh, and then they have to decide which of them would be the ideal scenario. Another activity to uh, develop leadership skills for any type of students, minefield. This helps build trust and improve communication skills. We have students working in pairs, one blindfolded, and using specified communication techniques, they need to negotiate their way around or over a minefield of obstacles. They need to use words like left, right, forward, backwards. Um, and the person blindfolded should not step on a mine. Um, one more activity for children or teens, magic carpet. Get a rug with enough room for everybody to stand within its boundaries. And then let the group know that their task is to work together to flip the rug over without any participants stepping off. Um, of course, instructions should be given in English. Otherwise, it makes no sense to use it in an English class, right? Um, another one for business students, if they're business English teachers in here, the what if game. Present different hypothetical and problematic scenarios to employees. Like you didn't follow rules or and therefore lost an important client or you lost a lot of money for the company. How do you justify this? What's your solution? This activity works best if you give them a very short time frame. They work alone first, think about it. The rehearsal time for productive skills, that is so important. Let them take notes, rehearse their thoughts, work in pairs, and then present the ideas to the full class. Um, another one for business students, the office trivia. This one requires a little bit of uh, research beforehand. Um, for example, you can have a list of questions like how many people named John work in the accounting department or how many people work in the IT department. This could work great if you build a cahoot with it. And the employee with the most correct answers at the end would be the winner. Okay, those are some uh, ideas to develop leadership skills within your students. And the third skill that I wanted to talk about, not much more time left, is innovation. Um, the whole point of innovation is, what I wanted to uh, talk about a little bit is how to be innovative in class. We have introverts, extroverts, and one huge difference between them is that extroverts get their energy from social interaction, introverts from quiet spaces. So the classroom only focuses on group work, noisy, chaos, and then we're only uh, benefiting one part of these students. If we have projects that give time alone for introverts to work as well, then we're going to be developing both type of students. Um, ideas from uh, to work on innovation, problem finding instead of problem solving, Look at problems, find situations, and have them find the problem. This requires intellectual imaginative vision to seek out what's missing, what should be added to something important. Um, using this strategy, teachers can give students the opportunity to think, ask critical questions, and apply creative ways to solve problem. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to um, continue with the other couple of um, ideas for innovation. Is it's time already? Some of the references I use for this. And now let me ask if anybody has any questions. Thanks so much, Karina. That was that was so lovely to hear about all of your ideas. So, so useful. Everyone, uh, please feel free to use the chat for any questions you have or 
uh, raise your hand and I can activate the audio uh, if you would rather turn on your mic. Oh, I can see. Okay, there we go. I'm, go I'm sending yeah, you a message that, that uh, asks you to unmute. That? Uh, yes, that's how you say my name. Okay, great. Okay, so Hi. Niacolo. Yes, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. I really loved your presentation. I took a lot of notes. And I just wanted to say thank you for your time and making us understand the importance of professional development. I would just like to add one thing that is important regarding professional development, and that is social capital, right? Oh, the reason that I mentioned that is because there's a woman called Julia Freeland Fisher. She's an American, and she focuses on K-12 education and edtech. And she speaks about the importance of social capital within the school environment, but more importantly, how schools can actually utilize the information that come from application processes to help students collaborate. And I saw that collaboration is one of the things that she spoke about. Yes. So it is yeah. something that maybe you'd like to look into. And there's a book of hers, okay. which is called Who You Know. And it provides some mm -hmm. insightful ways in which students can actually get insight from their fellow colleagues and also how the school can open up the space to facilitate collaboration. Great, thank you so much. Okay. Any other questions, comments, things to add? Let's see. I'm waiting that was very, very interesting. Questions. It really was. It really was. I see yeah. uh, some people thanking you already through the chat as well. Would anyone else like to say something or do you have a question? I feel like they're still there's, digesting all of your great ideas, Karina. So there's <laughs> somebody is asking for the references. So I'll share the slide with the references again. But then when the when you share the recording, they're going to be able to uh, absolutely use this as well. And as you're doing that, I'm just going to post our links to our social media because that's usually how we update you, everybody, about what we do. Okay. Just waiting to see if anyone else would like to say anything, but I don't see anything. So I'm going to say um, a very warm uh, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, Karina, for this very, very informative session. Oops, I think I can see a raised hand. So Melissa. Melissa, go ahead. Hi, Melissa. Um, would you like to unmute hi, yourself? Thank you so much. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, no, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I just have a, a question um, about professional de development. And I mean, we're seeing more and more uh, like AI enter language learning and like chat GPT. Uh, I just wanted to know what, uh, if you can, uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and what should teachers be doing? Because it is uh, it is growing bigger and bigger. So what should mm -hmm. teachers be doing to in terms of um, integrating AI in the classroom and also learning about it instead of being afraid of it? Yeah, that's exactly it. Professional development involves being able to research to find out how that tool can help you instead of saying, no, 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 I, I don't like it. Saying, oh, let's see, this could be interesting and have the tools needed to be able to use it wisely because like you said, we need to use it wisely. We need to use it, but wisely. So that requires investigating, researching, finding out how to use it, how people implement it, what's useful, what's not. I find it awesome. I mean, it helps so much. I want to write an email and, and I just write it in like rough terms and then I get like the an awesome uh written email, formal email, you know, and it, it's so time consuming to start thinking, okay, so I need to say this to say that. Um, I use it for everything. Creating exercises, gap fills, uh, remove the verbs in this following paragraph. 
or put the verbs in, in, in the base form in the following paragraph. And then you have a gap fill for your students in class. Absolutely. So, yeah. Learning about new technologies is nothing new, right? Especially if you're an online teacher. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Exactly. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure, uh, Karina. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you check the uh, the rest of the sessions that we've got running throughout the day. I'm just realizing that we haven't posted the link to the rest of the program. So let me just put that in the chat very quickly. But for now, I'm going to say thank you for joining us. And we hope to catch you in another session. And have a lovely day, Karina. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody enjoyed this session.